hi everyone. Um, my name is Ella and I work at Screen Skills. Welcome to our free online training. Oh, thank you all so much for joining us today for our craft session with Leo Anna Thomas and Matt Longley. They will be discussing managing the mental health of freelancers in physical production. I'll now hand you over to Leo Anna and Matt who will start your session. <coughs> thank you so much guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Matt Longley. Um, I started in the film industry something like 10 years ago um, when I was dispatched by my then company all the way down to Sunny Leavesden Studios um, where we were supplying a load of trackway. Um, and I think by that time you could probably see uh, the back lot from the moon because um, there was that much trackway down there. Um, I stayed um, doing that for a few years um, and then went in and I look after some of the um, some of the local uh, some of the smaller suppliers uh, doing little consultancy things. Um, I'd worked with um, Michael Harm, who was a location manager. Um, so when unfortunately he, he passed away uh, about three years ago um, and a friend of mine also passed away, um, I decided we'd set up um, a little non-profit company called Six Feet From The Spotlight um, to try and help uh, crew in the creative industry so that's music film tv theaters uh with their mental health um and do some training i set it up with a few mental health professionals um from the nhs um, and private practice so we've got those as well be, who are who look after us as well um and i'm an accredited iact instructor so we'll talk about iact later on but that's a, a, a training program um, that uh, I've been doing for Film London um, and I've been doing it for location managers, uh, unit nurses and things like that. I'm also a trustee of the Men's Health Forum, uh, which is a charity that looks after um, underprivileged men and boys because men uh, and boys are particularly useless at going to the doctors and getting any help. So uh, that's um, something that I try and help out with uh, as well. There's a lot of stuff, obviously, with COVID-19 at the moment. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. Groovy. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Leo Anna Thomas. I uh, have worked in the film and TV industry for about 16 years in the art department, and I started uh, as a trainee and assistant, and I'm now a standby art director. <clears throat> and I have been doing that for about five or six years as standby art director um, on films and TV shows and Netflix. Um, but into around about 2008, 2009, I had a nervous breakdown um, and felt uh, it was, I was having a, a hard time mentally at work um, and was being bullied at the time on a job. And uh, I decided to leave the industry and I left for about four years or so. And every now and again, I would do dailies. But during that time, I went into counselling and started learning to just kind of learn about mental health and psychology. Um, and when I came back to the industry in 2013, uh, worked pretty well. And then I've decided to use the skills that I'd learned in my therapy uh, to keep myself going at work and look after myself. Um, and in 2017, I lost a friend of mine, a production designer, Alan McDonald, to suicide. And a year later, another friend of mine, unit nurse, Morag Webster, also died by suicide um so i decided that as i've been very open about my mental health that i would uh try and see what i could do so i went into mental health first aid england for training and i developed t-shirts that said how are you on the front which is this one and mental health first aid on the back and i went into uh productions and basically said i'm a mental health first aider could you put my name on a call sheet on the unit list and i was on set basically being a standby art director as well as a mental health first aider and create the hashtag mental health and film. Um, I then uh, was introduced to Matt and we've basically been working ever since and I've been a member of Six Foot From The Spotlight. And I'm also a manager recently being trained by Matt himself. So that's... Yeah, uh -huh. you're now quite an integral part of Six Feet From The Spotlight. So uh, we'll go through that anyway. Um, I'm just gonna put some slides up for you all. Um, so what we wanted to talk to you today about is um, managing how you can manage mental health in film and TV um, and particularly uh, freelance workers in physical production. So um, hopefully we've got some 
solutions for you. I'll just run through what the agenda is. Uh, so we're going to talk about the prevalence, which is uh, how how much how many people have mental health issues, uh, both in normal life and also in the film and TV industry. Um, you guys probably know better than I do why the, why the film and TV industry is difficult, but we'll run through a few ideas there because they tie in quite well with the health and safety executives view um, on a few things. Um, some reasons why we should drive change. So we'll go through the duty care that productions have to freelancers, what the legal position actually is, um, how does stress and mental health issues impact your performance on set, um, and what are the commercial considerations that you can use um, to actually drive this change. Um, we'll also go through some of the solution that we think possible. Um, so we'll, we'll introduce you to the four pillars, um, how you can build a production mental health plan, um, what practical actions can you actually take on a production because we didn't want it just all to be theoretical, um, and what sort of training considerations might you need going forward. So um, we'll go through all of that. So we, first of all, what's the prevalence of mental health issues within the industry? Uh, just bearing in mind that just as with physical health, we all have mental health. So everyone has their own mental health. It can go up and down um, and can be good some days and bad some days. You probably all know that, but here we go. Yeah, so basically this slide is basically showing the, the difference between we all have, like Matt said, we all have mental health and sometimes it's going to be healthy, sometimes it's going to be ill mental health and that will fluctuate for everybody. But the Film and TV charity put out a survey, which some of you may know about, in July 2019. The first wellbeing survey of its kind. Uh, over 9,000 people responded to that. So the mental health issues uh, in crisis, the mental health crisis in the film industry, you can see that 87% of people have reported having a mental health issue within the industry. It's a lot higher than, than the general population. And it's significantly higher with numbers of suicidal thoughts, which is really concerning. Um, the statistics came back that 55% of people have thought about uh, suicide compared to 20% of the general population. Um, and 66% and of freelancers consider leaving, in the, leaving the industry because of its stresses and because of the bullying uh, and the strains that it causes on personal life. And as we mentioned in our introductions, both Matt and I have lost friends who work in the industry to suicide. And that's why uh, we're doing what we're doing to try and help. And so there's been seven in the last three years that we know about. Um, the next slide would kind of go into detail a bit more about why there is difficulties in the film industry. Um, so some of you might not work in the industry directly or have not had much experience of it, or maybe these points here make sense to you. Um, so working in film and TV, it's the, working away from home on, lo on locations, you're away from friends and family, uh, or you're just working long hours. And that whole work-life balance is completely off and causes a hell of a lot of problems. Um, and obviously the bullying and harassment issues have been coming to the surface recently as well. I mentioned I left the industry because I was being bullied myself and had nowhere to go for help. And that ties into the next point here that there is like in, in many other businesses, if there's something like that happening at work, you can go to a HR department or if you're feeling uh, mentally unstable and have a sick day, there is no sick pay. Uh, in our industry and therefore there's nothing there to kind of bring you back so in terms of return to work there's nothing there just to you're just thrown back in again and there's not a lot of communication or help and it's very fast paced um, so the changes are always happening um, there's a lot of last minute changes happening with scripts uh, being amended last minute locations changing and also each job can only last maybe a day a week or a month and then you start a new one again so you're always it's always fast paced to try and keep up with and there's this fear of of uh, only being as good as your last job so there's a lot of i've come across it myself where people say you know if you so any short of if you if you can speak up or want to say something that people aren't sure about people will then respond with you're only as good as your last job and just you know that pressure it's too it's a lot of pressure that people are under in the industry and it needn't be that way yeah, so uh, why should we drive change? Um, and that's not just to save lives. So there are, there are various reasons why we should drive a change um, to how we operate and how, how we treat people's <laughs> mental health and stress in the, in the industry. Um, 
So I'll go through the first one. There is uh, a legal duty of care um, to freelancers across the industry, and that's not just permanent employees. So under the Health and Safety at Work Act, and there are people in my day job, um, which I'm furloughed from at the minute, but Finch Consulting, who could probably bore you um, and you wouldn't even get for your tea because you'd be asleep. So um, there's a few there. Uh, the Health and Safety at Work Act really says that you sh any production, any place is responsible for everybody that's there, regardless of their status, whether they're employed, whether they're a volunteer, whether they're contracted, freelance, or even if they're a visitor, then you have a duty of care to their health. And that is their mental health is explicit in there as well as the physical health. So it's not just, um, it's not just physical health. So really we need to be trying to drive a parity with physical safety in mental health safety as well. So there's a moral, an ethical and a legal duty to do so. Um, lots of sets have um, health and safety advisors, um, but generally they only look at the physical risks. So we wanna try and get them to use, uh, to, to look at the mental health and the stress risks as well. Um, as we said, there's been um, seven people that we know of take their, uh, take their own lives in the industry. Uh, over the last three years, which is 33% higher than the national average. Um, and if that had been somebody who'd uh, fallen from a building um, or had been killed in a stunt, then there would be a, 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 an investigation by the HSE um, and then there would be fines. So um, there's a couple of high profile ones of those cases um, recently. We also have guilty knowledge because of, and what I mean by guilty knowledge is that um, because the industry knows it has an issue, um, the regulator, the health and safety executive, the HSE will look at that and say, well, you know, there's an, there's an issue, you must do something about it. Um, and conversations I've had with, uh, there, you'll find a lovely video of me somewhere on YouTube um, <laughs> talking to a health and safety executive lawyer. Um, Give out about, the link at the end of that. Yeah, oh well, yeah, thanks, yeah. Um, oh. I'm best off behind the camera. Uh, but uh, that you'll find that with me talking about that with a health and safety lawyer. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's something we can go through and talk to you about later. Um, so performance impact and how do, you, how do you improve efficiency on set? So I'll just talk about that. Um, we all need a little stress and, ex and excitement to motivate us um, every day to get out of bed and do things. Um, but when that becomes toxic. So when people lose control of that stress, uh, when they're in stress situations all the time, if you take it akin to a football team or a rugby team, they get, they get going for 90 minutes or uh, 80 minutes in terms of rugby. Um, but if they can't really continue that for so long, and that's what happens to people at the moment. So if they go into toxic stress, they can't control um, their body um, and they get very stressed. So work-related stress in the UK accounts for 45% of all lost time. So that's the most, the highest um, contributor to lost time in the UK. So it's not back pain, it's not anything else, it is stress. Um, the symptoms of toxic stress inhibit your cognitive behavior. So you make poor decisions when you have toxic stress. People are more prone to having accidents. Um, they also don't make the right decision for that production. Um, I know of cases where there's been 17 telehandlers on a set um, because people aren't talking to each other or, or because people aren't actually making the right decisions. So there's, there's that kind of things. It, there's various studies. I wrote a paper that was supposed to be given uh, next week to in Manchester, um, but studies show that uh, minimum uh, of 20% reduction in efficiency due to toxic stress. So people don't work as well when they're under, under duress. Um, and that it really affects their safety performance as well as their creative ingenuity. So they're not necessarily giving you doing as, as well as they can creatively either if they're under toxic stress. So that's another reason. Commercial considerations. There's obviously a perceived cost of doing stuff with mental health, but there are actual savings. The whole reason I was sent down to Leaves and Studios uh, 11 years ago was because they'd lost really control of over the trackway um, and how much there was there. If you think the spend on trackway, uh, I was on Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the last two parts, the trackway spend on that production was about 1.25 million. So it's quite a significant amount to lose control of. So I went down there to try and solve a few issues, save them money, move, it, move things around. They were talking to my crews, uh, we're getting stressed, the locations team were getting stressed about it, production were getting stressed because the trackway wasn't necessarily in the right place. So I went down there to try and look at it and um, put in processes in place so that A, it saved them money, reckon we saved them probably about 250 to 300,000 pounds. 
but also stopped the locations team and the production team having to stress about what's going on and also my crews so they by by doing that we we saved people's mental health to a certain extent it obviously was quite harry potter wasn't a bad production to be on but there was still quite a lot of stress there so good management practice will reduce your cost um there are studies especially by deloitte that came out um it's on the bbc about uh, six seven weeks ago um that showed that the productivity increases for every pound you spend on mental health and looking after your people and trying to reduce their stress it gains you five pounds and that can be in what they're buying what the decisions they're making whether they're needing overtime that sort of thing um so as we know through the industry budgets are uh, reducing and getting tighter so you need better management um need to work out how you're going to get people to be more efficient on that and a lot of the things that we're going to talk about can help with that as well um also what tends to happen as shown by the uh, film and tv charity is that <coughs> people leave the industry um so and that costs money basically that does cost money because you then have to retrain somebody or you have to go and find somebody else you have to get another person in you might have to pay more for them so it does um by keeping people in the industry and keeping them happy you will save money in the long run yeah we're going to move on to the four pillars solution. now and this is a, a solution one of the one solution that matt and i've been working on so the four pillars basically as you can see there starts off with prevention and prevention is key so basically you want to try and in, in, intervene during a production as 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 little as possible so with prevention you want to plan to produce uh the instances of stress and mental ill health so basically having this role in place is uh which we're going to talk about in a minute the well-being facilitator role you want to put things in place so you're looking after your crew and your cast so you don't have to intervene but when it comes to intervention the provision of trained people in to intervene and support people in the event of ill, Ill mental health so basically you want to uh you want to make sure that there are people trained to intervene whenever needed and that could be for a well-being facilitator uh anyone being a mental health first aider and obviously whilst people are still at work with resilience you want to make sure that they know how to uh keep themselves strong and you want to support people with mental ill health and to return to work and perform effectively in their role um so you want to help people in the small ways and have a have somebody on set that they can check in with somebody in the offices they can check in with and make sure that they can keep keep on top of their skills and uh, awareness to have res strong resilience and with measurement you want to basically see you need to measure this right because it's not been done before you want to basically see what's happening with these changes and see if people are getting better and feeling stronger just i'll quickly add now i was about to become i'm going to talk about the well-being facilitator role i was about to be a well-being facilitator on a bfi funded film in april but covid19 put that pause to that as it's put a pause to everything and the idea with measurement would be we put something in place where we would ask people to uh we'd have like a people anyone that would come to me you'd measure their role like who came to you and what issues they were having and what what actually helped them so you've got to make sure you measure it too basically yeah so, next so one prevention so um in a bit more detail about what we th what we mean about prevention and, and things you can do as a production so first of all is to have a policy now that doesn't necessarily have to be written down if it's a small production but um you need to think about what kind of policy you're going to have for mental health and stress that can help to improve the culture so um starting there uh, looking after people you want you want to set the tone that you're going to uh, help people and look after people um, that will improve the culture obviously then needs to be education awareness education and training so you need people around who understand um what mental health is and what the issues might affect um and uh, might affect mental health while you're on set um and there's also you can do training so that people can intervene and, and things like that but really this is around getting people to, to prevent the issues in the first place if everybody knows what's um going on uh, and how to prevent issues then then you can um get some uh, some movement forward you can do mental health risk assessments so you say mental health risk assessments usually they're stress risk assessments um the health and safety executive put out 
um, thing called the six standards, six management standards um, a few years ago. And again, there are people in my company at uh, Finch who can uh, bore you to death with those, but uh, they are very useful. Um, but they look at how, what demands are you putting on people? How much control do they have over their work? What support they got? How are relationships going, which is where um, bullying and harassment comes in, um, and a few other things uh, around that as well. Um, as with anything in mental health, uh, one solution doesn't fit everybody. Um, so things need to be organization and industry specific. Um, obviously the film and TV industry isn't all uh, office based. Um, people have always said to me, it must be glamorous when you're working on Harry Potter, when, not when I'm on a, in a marquee in a field and the top of a mountain in Scotland, it isn't, and it's February. Um, three months up there was, uh, was enough for me, thank you. Um, so also, uh, having a well-being facilitator or promotion of work, workplace well-being. So having um, things around so that people uh, you're looking after people's well-being. Uh, a lot of companies in corporate world do this, but they have fruit bowls, they have um, all sorts of things that go on, but obviously that's not necessarily specific for uh, film and TV. And also you need to get the leadership on a production or in the industry to normalize mental health issues. And the reason to do that is to stop stigma. So um, people won't speak up if they think that the person that they're working for thinks that mental health isn't, um, isn't worth the paper and it's, it's uh, something that will prevent the production from going forward. So leadership in the, in the industry and on the production need to be uh, behind all of this uh, and try and support people's mental health and stress at the same time. Yeah. So the wellbeing facilitator I've mentioned a few times about that role um, and I was about to trial it uh, as I mentioned on a BFI funded film which will still go ahead one day yes. soon I hope. Um, so basically I've done this role roughly uh, as I said on set three times in three different productions as, long, as well as being a standby art director. So these are the things that I kind of know of and tips that I've become aware of. First of all, it, like the prevention side of this role, a lot of people will say there's, there's no time for that. Like how are you going to have like therapy on set and 50 minutes here and there? That's not what it means. It's a prevention that just basically is an ongoing presence through prep, shoot and wrap and not just on set. It's um, within offices, workshops, on locations, when there are recce on stages. So that this role would be, a prevent uh, in place to help people prevent any stresses or mental health problems happening throughout and you want to keep employees at work Matt said it costs more money to train people to come back or new people so you want to keep them in work and you want to keep their, them healthy like physically and especially mentally um, and the role so this prevention side would be to keep communication and working with producers to develop mental health risk assessments uh, the job I was about to go on to the BFI funded film I had a meeting with the line producer and production coordinator where we talked through mental health risk assessments where certain pay, certain scenes in the, the film could be triggering for cast and crew in terms of uh, maybe a, a sexual assault or anything bullying of nature. And also if you're on certain locations, you could be working in disused hospitals. Uh, I've worked in abandoned disused animal testing factories and various other places that it just could be actually really unstable to go into. So you have risk assessments and open communication from HOD. So people, people who are running their own teams just to be, doesn't necessarily mean be open about your own problems if you don't want to share, but just kind of have a, a dialogue available. So you people in your crew feel safe uh, and, and obviously the promotion of the wellbeing facilitator role by twice weekly email updates. And what I mean by that is, uh, the idea that I was uh, was about to go into this job and the beginning of every week email uh, little tips and solutions let people know that I'm there uh, and at the end of the week just to kind of still again engage with people let people know that the that, that the crew and cast know that the role is there and it's just like a, a kind of make sure you always have in that always have that communication always yeah so intervention uh, in a production so this is where you're trying to get uh, if somebody is having an issue, um, you have some some way of helping them. So, um, as you do with physical health, um, you would uh, on a movement order or a call sheet, you'd have a physical first aider, have access, and you'd have access to professional help where you'd know where the nearest hospital was or the nearest doctors. Um, so, think about where you're going to get professional help. Now, that varies from part part of the country to part of the country. It's um, a little bit tricky, so um, you need to. Um, 
we can help a little bit with that because we've got access into the NHS to try and get that out. But um, getting that access is right is, is key. Um, you can also have peer support networks. Somebody might be just feeling a little bit like they need a chat um, or that somebody or something in particular is causing an issue. Just chatting it through with somebody else um, as part of a peer support network can often resolve that issue because if you know yes that is difficult or yes that person is difficult when it's the same thing with me um just having that chat with somebody can help you realize and somebody might also be able to stand back from it and give you some uh tips for how to overcome that so uh, a few years ago i was having a problem with um, a guy i was working with sending me emails at stupid o'clock um which were quite antagonistic and somebody just said to me well why don't you just create a rule in your inbox which takes that email away um, and puts it into a folder so you don't see it and you handle it when you're happy because um, it, it stopped it was stopping me sleeping basically um, and then I was getting worse and worse and worse as we as we went through um, well-being facilitators as well as unit nurses and um, IAP managers can be there so I, we six feet from the spotlight we trained a few unit nurses and medics um, that work on set um, any well-being facilitator could be in offices, workshops, stages, locations, and set anywhere. So, um, but available. There's also um, the film and TV charity support line, which is uh, was called Michael's Lane at once, but um, that's a fantastic um, thing that's, that the film and TV charity have set up. 0800 054 0000. If you need support, and that's the best way to to try and get some support um, if you if you need it. Um, also. Within intervention, there's a little bit about incident reporting, um, just monitoring who's using it and why, so that that then will feed into why you should, what you could you change, what isn't working, what is working, um, that will help, that that could help. So just monitoring it and a bit like you do an accident report, um, if somebody was injured, finding out why, um, what was causing that issue. Um, it might be that it's nothing to do with the production. It might be something they brought in from home, but at least you've got an idea of what's going on but obviously confidentiality is a is a bit key there so there are a few things around that which you won't get to here yeah so this is uh i mentioned earlier on at the beginning oh did i, I don't think i did mention it or did i mention it? i now can't remember i'm a little <laughs> bit nervous but um i was stress, i don't know if, I, don't know if I, right I mentioned it but i was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder in 2015 and uh from that subsequently i was then uh, attending dbt which is dialectical behavior therapy which is what you see here so with my mental health first aid training that i did i also took the skills that i learned from my own therapy which were incredibly effective and they are evidence-based and they work and these ones that are on the screen now are the ones that i use on set as a mental health first aider while being facilitated they're all fine change in your body you may have noticed and I keep doing this because my hands cold and I myself am using these techniques just to kind of change my body from not being too nervous in doing this so the first one is tips so temperature cold hand basically temperature intense exercise paced breathing and paired muscle relaxation anyone that's um having a panic attack especially uh is so overwhelmed and stressed basically our prefrontal cortex will shut down our memory will shut down we won't be able to think about what's happening we can kind of go around in circles and become quite stressed. So in, in changing our physiology, and it's chemically proven, as soon as you change that, your brain will then just kind of be wiped. It will just kind of pause and be in the moment, much like being mindful. So that's the same as the uh, DBT skill, stop. You stop and take a break. You observe what's going on inside and what's around you, and then you proceed mindfully. And the other one is radical acceptance meditation. Now this one I was taught in my, in my therapy and uh, I have the recording on my phone and now again, I will send it to people at work or will hold 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes in the morning and the afternoon to go through with anybody crew and cast that you just basically use a technique to be mindful and a breathing technique to stay present. And um, everything that we're mentioning is, like I said, physiologically to help to help with easing ill, uh, Ill mental health. And the other the other techniques are kind of taken from various parts of uh, the mental health first aid training and also because one technique might not work for one person it's it's very much individual based uh, the main one on the left hand side is algae and that's basically keeping an eye and um, assessing for risk of suicide or harm uh, you're listening non-judgmentally you're giving reassurance and information and you're encouraging appropriate professional uh, professional help 
and then encouraging self-help and other support strategies as well. So it's basically an observation, somebody on set that's neutral and independent from production, just to keep an eye on everybody and spot things that maybe we're all too stressed and running around we can't see. Uh, so these techniques are to suit various people because obviously I've had an experience with someone where I was trying to do a breathing technique and as soon as I mentioned breathing they started panicking more. So some of these might not work and it's trial and error but if they do work on some people the breathing exercise is similar in yoga, nostril technique, uh, nostril breathing techniques. Certain positions will move around and just stretch in certain ways will ease some of the stress. I was doing star jumps before this, before this presentation to try and ease my own levels of anxiety. Uh, moving the body around and also aromatherapy oils. Uh, I kept uh, lavender oil on me through these three productions where I was a mental first aider. And sometimes this, this role, all it needs is a little incremental change. People will come up to me and just be like, put their neck out or their wrists and just put some oil on them. And it brings you down from any stress or anxiety that you might be having and therefore safe to signpost people for extra help if they need it or return back to work. And the last one is eye masks, which is uh, similar to mindfulness in terms of sensory deprivation. And basically, it will stop mental negative thoughts. That's all right, Matt. You can go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. My, <laughs> finger, my finger slipped. It must go be ahead. all the aromatherapy all oils they put yeah. on my fingers. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, resilience and measurement. So resilience is all about supporting people who either returning to work following a, uh, having stress or a mental health issue. Um, or if they have an existing condition. So um, I think around 66% of the population have had a mental health issue at some point, or one in four every year diagnosed with uh, mental health. So mental health issue um, of some sort, usually um, depression or anxiety. But uh, you can plan for that um, by having um, a well-being plan um, or just sitting down with that person and talking to them about what it is that causes the issues. Um, I've had people who've worked for me um, in a different uh, construction where uh, construction is um, worse than the film and TV industry to a certain extent. Um, but you just sit down with that person, and work out what it is that's stressing them out um, um, and control the things that you can control. Um, you can't control everything in their life, but you can control some things. So you can maybe change the way they work, um, how they're working, what people are coming to ask them for, uh, that sort of thing. And just, just, adjust it so that's a reasonable adjustment usually they don't cost a lot of money um i think one study said about 75 pound maximum something like that so there's not a lot of money to to do reasonable adjustments and also you can have, have people mentoring um so budding up with somebody who's in your network and production there's a few things around that now so there's uh, share my telly job if michelle's watching then um, that's a really good one but that's budding up with somebody um who can help you out and just check in on you i have friends who um uh, I've worked with colleagues that I've worked with who were just check in on each other every so often um, and just make sure they're all right. And if they're having an issue, we, we chat it through, um, give them a kind of non-judgmental um, thoughts about what they're, what they're trying to do. Um, measurement is really, again, around measuring what, uh, how, how, it's, how it's working and will feed back into what you can do to change things um, and what you might need to do, just as you do with physical safety. If you have an accident, you work out what went wrong and then change something. So it's exactly the same sort of thing there, the measurement. So how can you build a mental health plan for your production? Um, Leo and I do podcasts and we talk a lot about small steps um, and I won't go into the Martin Luther King um, <laughs> <laughs> quote that, that comes from you have from, to say it now <laughs> i do um you don't have to see the whole staircase to take the first step i think is the was what was about is there that right go. i think that's about something right. like that not thermonuclear yeah. war is something or i can't remember what that was um anyway so uh we all have a um we all have a duty um uh, of care to people's mental health just as we do with physical safety so everybody on set um has a duty of care to everybody else um regardless um there's industry bodies out there that we need to get help from so film and tv charity are doing a lot they've got their whole uh, picture program coming up at some point uh production guild bafta back to pact um the main production companies have loads of stuff out there for their normal employees and uh, not so much for the freelancers so we need to get them to come to the party and change on that um where you've got smaller players or smaller suppliers, can you use suppliers who have a mental health policy and who have 
look after their staff as well. So if there's two suppliers, can you identify them? Uh, can you choose from them based on what they do with their staff, um, not just on the price or the cost of whatever they're doing? Your industry leaders need to help as well. Um, and you guys, freelancers yourselves, um, need to help out um, as well. How can you, you could take this on board and try and drive the changes through on the productions that you're working on um, and help just uh, just be positive about it and say, right, I'd like to do something. That's another possibility. So um, how do you do it? Well, use the four pillars. So think about what you're going to do to prevent issues. What do you do if somebody does have an issue? Um, et cetera, uh, what, what can you do if somebody comes, when somebody comes back and what, what, how can you measure it? Um, there are different, different ways for each one. But intervention strategy needs to be first. You need to support people before you can do all the prevention. So you need to have some of the, some of the intervention steps in there. Even people like myself who work as, um, as an IAC manager or mental health first data need support um, occasionally because sometimes you might be dealing with something that's quite, quite stressful yourself. So also then put in, how can you train people? How can you give them awareness? How can you educate them? Um, the managers that you use, the heads of department, the supervisors really need to understand their role in, in, in improvements. Have you got anybody on the production who is trained in mental health? Uh, if not, can you get them trained or can you find a way of getting them trained? Um, eliminate stigma. So there's, Leah will talk a bit in a second about some, um, some anti-stigma campaigns, but crew and actors must feel that they can talk to somebody. They shouldn't fear, shouldn't fear it. They shouldn't fear going to talk to somebody and getting help. Um, cause quite often that can, um, if they do go and get help, it might bring them back quicker. Um, but also build positivity into the plan. Um, try and make the experiences of mental health positive rather than all about ill health. So how can we improve things? How can we be positive about mental health? The film and TV industry creates some fantastic content. It's kept everybody going during this, um, this quite lengthy lockdown period now and without Netflix, um, and things I think my kids would have gone up the wall, um, but build positivity into it. Um, how can you, how can you be positive and promote positive things and tailor the plan to the situation? Not, there is no one size fits all for mental health at all or stress. Um, it needs to be tailored to what you're doing. It might be because you're a small production, you're a big production. You might be out in the sticks somewhere. You might be in a studio. All of those have different factors that you need to consider. Uh, oh, this one's me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, practical, practical actions on a production. Yeah. So things that you can do in a production, I guess what Matt said of various sizes. Um, first of all, the pre prevention side of it. So you want to basically, you can use things like time to talk, the anti-stigma campaign and just keep open communication about uh, other campaigns that you may know of that are, that are relevant at the time and going around. Um, you want to ensure, this is a big one, you want to ensure that breaks are taken. Uh, so many people, myself included, at some points sit at their desks and don't leave and sit and have lunch there. And just, uh, if you can ensure that people take breaks, and that could even be, uh, I've worked on production where they would supply a nice lunch once a week or something that the production can do just to ensure that people will get up from their desks and have some break or take mini uh, breaks every so often. Um, and I guess that ties into the next one, which is a well-being window. So you want to make sure if you, keep, you give yourself that time slot, we don't do it enough. Give yourself that time slot to do something good for yourself. And whatever that may be, it doesn't have to be anything huge, just small little things that put a smile on your face. And that's the same as the, uh, the bites that the production could do. The well-being bites could be anything in the office or the environment. That, oh, excuse me. Anything in the office or the environment that can put smile on people's faces you could put i don't know funny jokes up on the wall or make sure there are lovely like plants in the office something that looks a bit more homey and just it makes a big big difference i've been in productions where they've had that and you just feel like it just changes your well-being or it just makes it, it makes a it makes a difference uh we mentioned earlier on about the mental health risk assessments Again, um, make sure that you have them written up for certain days of shooting that you think might be a trigger or certain locations that could be a trigger. And make sure you just keep an eye on that, even in the offices. Um, make sure that HODs and supervisors are trained in mental health awareness or the, or the IACT manager that, uh, being an IACT manager that Matt tr uh, teaches people in. Um, just make sure they're available to understand that. 
And if you can, personal well-being plans. This is something I was going to do on the, the BFI funded film. It's something really minimal. Five questions just to everybody, even in an email. Make sure you have a plan that looks after and tailors to yourself and your own mental health awareness for the, your job. Um, and in support, you want to make sure that, yeah, trained mental health crew. You want to get uh, people on board to make sure that they're there to support your crew and your cast. Um, and make sure people know who they are. And that could be written down on call sheets um, and on unit lists or making yourself visible like I have with my T-shirts. So you know you could visibly see somebody. And the peer network, talk to each other, buddy up. Like we've said before, the strength, the more we share with each other, the less alone we feel. And the less alone we feel, we can help one another. We're all in this together. And uh, the film and TV charity obviously has their line um, make sure it's on all call sheets. Every production I go on, I say, please, may you put this on the call sheet uh, underneath the medic area. And make sure there's safe spaces. Again, on the job I was about to go on to, um, there's a, make sure there's a safe space. It doesn't have to be something glamorous. It could be the size of a cupboard. It's just something where you have a space where you can go away and be with a wellbeing facilitator if you need them. Even if it's two minutes or on location, make sure there's a space somewhere where you can move away from set. Give yourself that safe space. Harry Potter broom cupboard, yeah? All that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So some of the training considerations, uh, we're nearly there, guys. It's nearly tea time. Yeah. Um, it yeah. very much depends on role, um, and there's mental health first aid, and there's the act, which we've talked about. Um, there are various providers of all of these. Um, so uh, heads of department supervisors and the wellbeing facilitator really need to know how to manage mental health and wellbeing issues uh, in the workplace. Um, how they can connect with crew and actors um, to, if they are having an issue. Um, how, how can they support that person if they are having a mental health issue in the workplace? So how, how do they look after them and what should they do with them? And how to promote positive initiatives to help prevent the issue. So um, that's what um, the IAT course does. There are others around as well that do that. Um, but that's basically the... the um, the, the set of it um unit nurses and the well-being facility also need to have something a little bit more in depth um so something like mental health first aid um but there's more uh they it gives them a more in-depth knowledge and it, they can then use that to intervene and get people signposted for help while they're on set but also advise the production um on what they should be doing or if there's a particular issue um help advise on what's going on um there and how you could how you could overcome that issue beautiful so just a quick few things about mental health first aid. A lot of companies have put in mental health, just mental health first aid. There are several providers. There's MHFA England, which uh, Leo used. Um, there's Nuco as well. Um, we did a version of it as well, which was um, done by um, a director in the NHS. So um, he, he has to train that. I can't do that one. Uh, but the health and safety executive advice is that mental health first aid should only really be used um, and is only effective as part of a wider plan to improve mental health. So I've worked for a company where there was mental health first aiders all over the place. I lasted four months um, because I came off, I ended up walking out with stress. Um, three of my team were off with stress as well due to, um, due to bullying from one of the, one of the senior managers. Um, but, and also just remember that physical first aid comes after an accident. So mental health first aid is exactly the same. Um, you want to try and prevent physical injuries, try and prevent mental or stress injuries as well at the same time. Um, and you must have support there. If you do have me mental health first aiders, they need to know where to go to get support as well. Not just, uh, yeah. not, not, they can't be there for everything. They do need to help themselves. Yeah. So some of the other considerations, tailor the plan to small and large productions. Um, Wellbeing facilitator, we've said, um, could be a dual role uh, on smaller productions. It's probably better if um, it's one person um, but yeah. uh, or a separate person, but it could be a dual role. Um, so obviously Leo's done that as a standby art director um, on, on a couple of productions. Um, the more people are, that are aware of issues and how to deal with them, the better. So um, try and talk to everybody, get as many people out it's it's a little bit of steps um there may be resistance at first but as more and more people know about the issues um and how to deal with them then the better um one thing that comes up sometimes when we do this talk is that well-being facilitator is there to help and advise rather than direct what's happening so um they're there to help help the production make the great content but do it safely 
just as a health and safety advisor is. Um, and they can actually save you money. So if they can get somebody back onto set quicker than, than they would, and if they haven't been there, then they've saved you money. Um, and a, just a little point, a little additional communication in all the time I've worked in big companies, little companies, just a little commu additional communication can have massive benefits. If people know what's happening, they don't get as stressed. They know why they're doing something. They don't get as stressed. Um, um, they know what's going to happen then they're better off obviously at the moment we all don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks let alone what's going to happen on the next production um, but uh, it's a, a little bit of communication can help um, yep. so the last slide hooray oh we did it oh, <laughs> nice so some next yep. steps um yep. Obviously, I specialise in the duty of care um, and the legal side of things and also do the IAC training. Got a couple of courses running over the next couple of weeks, um, some location managers on Friday, and I'm doing a couple for charity next week as well. Where I'm just, uh, we don't make money out of it anyway, but I'm donating everything to, um, to help freelancers. Um, yeah. discuss, Leo's got her email there, mentalhealthinfilm at gmail.com. So if you want to discuss yeah. how, wellbeing facilitator and the things around that, I'll also get involved in that as well. If you have a mental health issue, please call the film and TV charity on 0800 054 0000. Um, that's, they're the best thing, best people to talk to. Uh, and you can listen to our wonderful podcasts. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> they're on set. They're all free. Uh, there's lots of them now. And we've got a big one coming out tomorrow with um, U2's creative director, which is quite an, in, quite an interesting chat. Um, yeah. Not to do with film, to do with uh, that, uh, obviously U2's big sets and George Michael and people but they're on SoundCloud um, uh, men under mental health in film or you can look for them on um, Spotify or on iTunes six feet from um, six feet from mm. mental health in film or uh, yeah. search that um, and Leo has a hashtag mental health in film so um, yeah. there's, there's our website there as well so thank you for listening everybody I think we've done it in 49 minutes which is slightly longer thank you so yeah. let, let me just see if there's I've, any questions. Let's have a look. Um, is the wellbeing facilitator the same as an MHFA? -er? No. Um, to do a wellbeing facilitator, you would have to try and have a little bit more training. So understand some of the uh, therapy techniques, not really use them. But the uh, mental health first aid is really to signpost people elsewhere. Um, this is about trying to get somebody to um, stop on sets. So it's a little bit more... Than the, than there's the a, there's a few more techniques to it, like those other techniques from dialectical behavior therapy. And also this role doesn't exist yet. Like I said, it was about to be trialed. So we, the idea of this presentation and the work that we're doing is to try and hopefully my, our, goal, our, goal, our goal together is to make this mandatory. So this role is actually needed as well as having an, a medic on set as physical health. There should be a role that just covers mental health. So this is still kind of in its infancy but we're able to train people with the skills that I know and what Matt knows to try and build as many people as possible when this yeah. role will become mandatory. Yeah. Um, There's a question about bullying and what can you do if it's coming from the top? Uh, I.e. the person who's hired the wellbeing facilitator. Yeah. Um, I've had this where my boss has been the person who's been bullying me. Um, so you would in that instance have to try and talk to somebody else um, either through um, if there's another producer or if there's another person you can actually go to confidentially um, and talk to them, um, think yeah. about a strategy of how, and, and this is where the peer networks come in um, as well to try and talk to, talk to other people. Uh, it's not yeah. an easy thing. I know that it's not an easy thing because I've been through it myself. Um, yeah. But yes, um, you need to, it, it, it's about something. Have you got something on that, Leo? Yeah. Well? So yeah, I just want to add, um, I know we're running out of time. Um, I just want to add that I, on a production, a quite big production, uh, when I was standby director and mental health first aider, there was an instance of um, bullying and harassment taking place by a HOD to their, uh, to, to their employees below them. And I was actually, I actually offered my services and said I would happily um, mediate in a meeting with producers and try to act as neutral as possible. Um, in the end, the two people said that they were okay, but they felt really, really supported that I had come in and tried and offered my help and I helped them on a daily basis at work. Um, and in the end, they decided not to have me involved in the meetings, but just having that role there to help. This is why I think the dual, having a dual role is, 
is the first step but if it can be an entirely neutral independent role i think that's the best thing to have if that answers your question yeah. um what else uh, there's another have? one about often the tone of a, on a set is established or at least influenced by a particularly strong personality in a position of power um we discussed this didn't we the other day um on the podcast with uh emily yeah um again it's a difficult one that that's why to a certain extent having somebody who's neutral might help um yeah but again it's it's very similar um talking to other people and, and eventually calling them out and um i had a discussion with quite a quite a well-known director at one point where he wasn't talking to me and he was talking to me through somebody else um and in the end i just had to call him out um yeah. and i'm still i still worked afterwards i think um. <laughs> it's it is it is a difficult situation to find yourself in because obviously that is that we spoke about it that fear of um if you don't speak up for yourself or feel like you can't or if someone's or you feel like you can't speak up for somebody else because you're scared that you might be not hired again it is a difficult one that's still being worked on but i having having a neutral role there or someone you can actually step away from and speak and say actually can you it's it's like intimacy coordinate coordinators if you know it's a it's a person in between the director and the actors to make sure that this is a careful um way of working and you're helping there as a support so having a well-being facilitator could be in this instance if someone is being um in a toxic presence or someone is being shouted at there is someone that can come in and help and you're, you're supported by somebody that doesn't really you wouldn't like a, if i was if i was be, i have been shouted at by many directors and i wouldn't feel comfortable to ask if the boom op can come and help me because they're probably worried about their role and what that's going to do to them so a neutral person the better i hope these are answering your questions we're trying to like bullet point yeah. rush them so we um, get them in what should we do if a colleague confides in us that they are struggling? Sometimes people will feel more comfortable speaking to their peers than senior staff. Yeah, um, exactly. So that's why trying to get as many people as we can trained to know what to do um, is a good idea um, because what you would do is sit down with them, talk about what the, there are various things you can do, coping strategies. Um, you can refer them to uh professional help or there is a lot of help out there and that's the main thing that some of the things that we do when we're training people is people don't realize how much help there is there um and some of the little things you can do to, to try and help so yes people yeah. do speak to their peers rather than senior staff um that's why mental health first aiders shouldn't necessarily just be senior staff they should be people who have empathy and know what to do um and people who are well-being facilitators as well um need to know what to do and yeah the people will not necessarily go to a boss uh with an issue because i once did that and that didn't end very well um it wasn't me that had the issue i went and said that i'd spoken to a psychologist um, and my boss told me that that didn't look very good on me um so i ended up leaving the company but uh yeah. that, was, that was a different kind of thing so yes um do uh, the more people who know what to do is the better so um yeah. there are there are lots and lots of places to get that you can refer people to or discuss with and that's them. and that's what this well-being facilitator role is essentially about it's not there to give we can't we haven't got 50 minutes to give therapy we you know how fast paced it is sometimes it's just like two minutes three minutes and you can see a well-being facilitator a thousand times a day it's having that instance of stop and pause I need to breathe. I need some physical and mental help right now so I can go back to work or assess if something's a bit more, um, uh, a bit more needing like, immediate help signpost safely. And when you're stressed out and when you're panicked, I know I've had it, you just can't think about what you can do to help yourself. So it's able to be there. Question here about should MHFAs and well, we've said treat all communications with crew members as confidential. Yes to a certain extent unless they need to refer it to somebody to get them help um there's a lot of nuances about that but yes they shouldn't then be sharing that with uh yeah our, strict uh, confidentiality uh, unless it's... unless there's a real safety issue um yeah yeah that's if somebody's at risk of harm then you might need to talk to somebody else but um generally you would uh, the, the general stories don't no gossip it's just going to be yeah. strictly what you would need to do to help that person um that's yeah the, that's the i've had it i've um, i've had it on on sorry to interrupt matt i've had it on 
on set where people will talk to me and I immediately say if the timing is right just to let you know this is not going any further than me I'm not telling production and I have told them that if it's something that I feel is a major concern then I will may have to break that confidentiality but and that's the same as the measurement no names will go down in terms of measuring the, the, the this role it's always someone comes to me and they have, they, have, they need help it will be the, their job title and how I help them and was it effective would not break confidentiality at all unless they are looking to harm themselves or somebody um, else where can you access train to become a certified wbf can you do it online or remotely we can do some of it online at the moment um yes so uh i would email um leo uh if you yeah. want to do this uh work out how we're going to do it and this uh, is what matt and i are trying to do this whole thing is an outline of what the infancy of this, this this creation that we have is how we can train people yeah there's a lot of stuff around bullying um there's a lot of work going on in the industry at the moment to try and stop bullying um BFI doing great stuff. Yeah, um, and there are protocols and things like that. So um, what we're hoping to do is get some things in the industry set up so that there is somewhere to go and talk about it so that there can be accountability in the uh, in the bullying side later on. Um, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody's then put there's back to deliver stuff on bullying. They do. There's a lot of stuff. We've kind of not touched on bullying too much in this. Uh, more around stress and mental health, but obviously bullying is a factor. I don't. Yeah, you're right there. Yeah. Um, uh, so somebody who's being there's one here about being picked on uh, by another peer. What would you say to help them cope? Um, there, it depends on how they're doing, how they're being picked on. Um, I've had that myself. Uh, and what I did, as I said, was um, try and not answer their emails when I wasn't feeling right. I would put them in a place where they can't be. And I then try and get all my facts in place and talk to others, talk to other people as yeah. well um, and see if they can come up and help you um, with your relationship with that person. So that's that, yeah. that's what I would I would do. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've been bullied, as I said at the beginning of this, that's the main reason why I had a breakdown. Yeah. I left the industry, and, but I learned a lot of skills in that time now that I, if I sense it's coming that way at all, I buddy up with someone, speak to somebody who I trust that I can kind of have a gentle dialogue to see. And then like Max said, check the facts, check the facts is another DBT skill, check the facts, see how you're feeling emotionally. And if you do want to, if you do want to talk to the person who might be bullying, I recommend having somebody with you that you trust or someone you can talk to immediately after in case that conversation goes wrong yeah if you want to speak to that person in general there's a is there a mental health policy we could see for guidance um yes if you the person who asked that wants to email me uh i can give you a sample of one uh i'd started writing one for warner brothers Ooh. as a guess as a as a sample so yes please please do uh, email me mattel at sixfeetfrom.org and I will send you a sample mental health policy um, along with some stress. Um, it's not exciting reading, but it's, uh, yeah, it's good. Um, I've seen the size of some of those documents, Matt. It's just, yeah. wow. Leo's email is uh, mentalhealthinfilm at gmail.com. Yeah, it's on the... Uh... The last slide that we've got up on the screens, uh, all the information's there, if that's still up on the screen. Yeah. Oh, stamina. Yeah, stamina. Um, ah. Yeah, that's really, I think, uh, physically, uh, uh, mentally, mental stamina. Um, I'm not quite sure how you'd handle Physically, I can help you with that because I'm a cricket coach as well. But um, <laughs> mentally, mental stamina for it, uh, really, yeah. I think everybody's going to go through some what they're calling decompression when we get out of this because uh, yeah. we've all been doing things at a slightly different pace to what we used to and we may may take us a little while to get back so i would try and do stuff for your own well-being while you get when you get back to set um try and have your five minutes if you can hide uh as a runner um i know it's not easy um but try and do that um what, what was the question about stamina i didn't uh, see was um, it just what can you do yeah what because you've been off work for so long um oh. whether, whether you'd um be able to do that uh yeah i tell you what i'm doing stamina. right now i don't know if it i don't know if it mentally who knows, stamina who knows, I presume. yeah who knows when we're going back to work and i try and do one day at a time what i've started doing in the last three weeks is set my alarm 
not for a ridiculous o'clock, but I've been setting my alarm for 6 a.m. every day. And even if I'm getting up and just taking it easy, I already feel an improvement in my own well-being because it's so easy just to lie in and sleep in until 10, 11. For me, that wasn't working. I realized it was, it was shortening my days, evidently, and it was actually being quite harmful to my own mental health. So maybe if it's some sort of buildup of a stamina mentally, maybe that might help. It doesn't help everybody, but if you can just set your alarm in the morning and try and have an idea of just wake up. Um, so when you do go back to work and it will be a shock for people who work film and TV hours, it will be a shock. And that's why I started doing it. Just that might be a way forward to help just to slowly build up your stamina. And when you go back, everyone's in the same boat. This is another thing that's great about this horrible situation is everyone is in the same boat. So when you go back to work, it's going to be strange for everyone, especially, especially if there's social distancing measures that we have to take as well. And, um, but I find comfort in that in myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think we've got most of them, haven't we? Um, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Thank you, Screen Skills. And thank you, everybody who's joined. Thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, have a lovely evening. And uh... Yeah. Take care. Please take care. And please contact us and, um, on Instagram, on Twitter. And hopefully we'll see some of you in person when we get some more training underway. And see you face to face. But yeah, thank you so much, guys. Please take care.